Okay, so I read a lot of books. I read them to like help with my productivity and my life, to like improve my understanding of the world, and also for fun. And sometimes all of that stuff fits together. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about 12 books I read this year that I think anyone would get a lot from. And I'm gonna try and distill the kind of most important points or ideas down in them so you can get an idea of whether you'd like to read them yourself. Let's go. Okay, the first book is Zero, The Biography of a Dangerous Idea by Charles Seifer. Okay, so Brian Johnson recommended this book to me when I interviewed him for The Guardian, and it's a really fascinating read. So the basic idea is that it took ancient civilizations like a while to realize that zero has value as a concept because you usually start counting one, two, three when you're counting like horses or arrowheads or whatever. But then the first civilizations to discover it and use it, like the Babylonians, sort of benefited from that in all sorts of surprising ways. And then there's a whole discussion about how thinking about zero and infinity led to huge conflicts within Aristotelian philosophy and Christianity, taking us all the way up to the way zero helps us think about both the incredibly tiny quantum world and the world of massive cosmological events. So I was pretty good at maths at school, but I'd forgotten an absolute ton of it. And this book kind of explains it in a really engaging, memorable way. And it goes through everything from like Zeno's paradox, which is the one you might have heard about Achilles and the hare, right up to like Riemann spheres and probability and all that kind of thing. So if you want a book that can kind of introduce you to the beauty and value of maths, how it developed throughout history and how it still relates to the stuff we all care about, then I really do recommend this. I actually started reading another very famous maths book called How to Solve It after that, but I'm still kind of working on that one. So let's move on to Consider Phlebas. By the way, the title comes from a T.S. Eliot poem. So I've read a couple of Ian M. Banks' culture novels before, but I've never quite got round to this one, which takes on like the central protagonists of the whole series, from the perspective of an outsider who's actually kind of against them. So if you haven't heard of the culture before, the idea is that they're this sort of utopian civilization that have solved basically all of the problems in their lives through advanced technology. They've been like genetically modified to live for hundreds or thousands of years, and they just spend all their free time doing basically whatever they like. And in this book, they're involved in a war against this race of giant three-legged aliens that are a lot more like traditional sci-fi kind of civilization in that they're really religious and authoritarian. And why I found this really interesting this year in particular is that the culture lets like AIs do a lot of their thinking for them, whether it's in the form of these little drone sort of robots that they have following them around everywhere, or these giant minds that make the collective decisions for basically their entire civilization. And as generative AI becomes more widespread and useful, it's kind of getting easier to envision a society in which AI has kind of solved all of the main problems for us, like scarcity and starvation and poverty and climate change. And then the question becomes, what do we do with the rest of our lives? And I think that's really interesting because considering what we would do if all of our problems were solved and we could do basically anything we wanted, I think probably tells us a lot about the things we really value in our lives. By the way, I actually agreed to read this alongside a friend who'd never read any culture novels before. And the way we did it was we read it together and kind of swapped WhatsApp notes as we went along, which was really fun. It was like a miniature book club. And so if you'd like to keep up with what I'm reading or what I'm thinking about reading next, then I have a free newsletter where I go through all of that link in the comments. And that's also the first place I discuss the next book in this list, which is Factfulness by Hans Rosling. And this is another one of those books that is kind of by a guy who's spent his whole life researching a subject and wants to convey it to you in the best terms he possibly can. So the basic idea is that it's about the fact that the world is getting better in a bunch of surprising ways and that people don't always realize that. So the book actually starts with a quiz that includes questions like, in the last 20 years, the proportion of the world population living in extreme poverty has doubled, remained more or less the same, or almost halved? Or what is the life expectancy of the world today? And if you're like most of the people that Rosling has surveyed in the past, your answers to those questions are probably more pessimistic than the actual state of the world reflects. And so this book is about the 10 different instincts that kind of distort our perspective and can kind of negatively shift the way we look at the world. And it's not all roses. Rosling admits that there are still a bunch of problems in the world, but his point is that you're not gonna fix any of these problems by having like an unrealistic vision of what the world is actually like. So this book is about helping you to embrace a worldview that's based on fact, which will then let you focus on the things that matter the most. And then another book that will hopefully help you see the world in a more informed way 
is super forecasting by Philip Tetlock and Dan Gardner. And so the premise of this book is that everybody has to make decisions that involve forecasting in their like daily lives, whether that's like looking at the stock market or deciding what might be a good job to have in like 10 or 20 years. And what the authors have found is that there's a small group of people, about 2% of the population, who are much better at making these forecasts than almost anyone else, including like government experts and paid intelligence agencies. And the authors basically spent years testing people for these skills using something called the Good Judgment Project, where they challenged them to make a series of forecasts, which they could sort of change as they went along. And their results were then kind of ranked and weighed and scored in a complicated system that showed who the best people were. And it turned out that the people who were best at it, or the super forecasters, all had like a similar set of traits that you can kind of try and develop yourself. So this book is full of fun little stories and examples that are kind of interesting, but I do think it's also like a practical guide to how to think more probabilistically in your everyday life, which I think can be super helpful. But I also don't think you want to think too logically, which is why I recommend the next book, which is Delicacy, a memoir about cake and death. So this is by a comedian called Katie Wicks, who you might recognize from TV shows like Ghosts, but I actually bought it because a friend recommended to me and I didn't even realize who'd written it until I was about halfway through. And it's basically a memoir full of very short and very long chapters, all sort of tenuously linked together by different cakes that the author's eaten, but all really about her like experience of trauma and depression and death. And if that sounds like kind of a depressing read, it really shouldn't. Katie Wicks is really funny and a very good writer, and you can tell she's felt a lot about how to articulate her feelings about these things in a way that's gonna be kind of useful and relatable to other people. So if you've lost anybody that's important to you, I think you will probably get a lot out of this book. I certainly did. And even if you haven't yet, like it's kind of an inevitable fact of life, so you might wanna put this on your reading list because it's a very good book. And it's not really about cake. Okay, next up we've got When We Cease to Understand the World. Okay, so for the first quarter of this book, I thought it was one of the most incredible things I'd ever read in my life. It's basically four kind of interconnected short stories. And the first one, Prussian Blue, is this sort of mad breakneck dance through all of these different scientists and scientific innovations that alternately changed the world and killed thousands or even millions of people. So a good example is the story of Fritz Haber, who invented the nitrogen-based fertilizer that saved the world from famine, but then went on to develop Zyklon B, the gas that killed millions of Jewish people in concentration camps during World War II. And so the first story is apparently about 99% fact, and then the like second, third, and fourth ones get more into characters, and they sort of slide a bit more into fiction, and I didn't find them as interesting, to be honest, but this book is absolutely worth reading for the first quarter, and it's a short enough read that you can get the rest done in like a couple of days. Absolutely recommended read. And then on a more practical level, I also read Alchemy, The Surprising Power of Ideas That Don't Make Sense. So this is by the vice chairman of Ogilvy, which is one of the most successful advertising agencies in the world. And the main argument of the book is that great ideas are often built around a core that is kind of surprisingly irrational and based on like a version of human nature that doesn't always behave in a perfectly logical way. At Ogilvy, Sutherland founded a division that employs psychology graduates, and their motto is, test counterintuitive things because no one else does. So a good example is that when the Sony Walkman was first being developed, Sony co-founder Akio Morita was told that the company could add a recording function to the device for just a few extra dollars. And that seems like it should make sense, but Morita actually refused saying that a recording function would make people confused about what the device was supposed to be used for. Was it supposed to be for like dictation or recording live music or what? By removing that feature, they did more to push the desired behavior change of convincing people to like walk around with music on. And ultimately, the Sony Walkman changed people's behavior in like a huge way. By the way, Sutherland points out that the technical design term for this is an affordance, which is a term he thinks everyone should know, which I had never heard of before this year, but which also came up in another book I read a couple of months later, which was How We Learn to Move. So this book is by a sports coach called Rob Gray, and it's basically an argument against the idea that repetitive drills or really explicit coaching are the best way to learn physical skills. A really simple example is that in one study, young tennis players were either given detailed instructions on how to hit a forehand shot or told, hit the ball like the shape of a rainbow. So in the first one of these, you're immediately giving the player the solution to a problem and forcing them to reproduce it. But in the second one, you're encouraging them to use their own body and find their own way of moving, which will ultimately lead to them finding their own way to move 
and give them less chance of choking over time. This approach is broadly called ecological dynamics and it's something that's really catching on in the sport of Brazilian Jiu Jitsu which is something I spend quite a lot of time thinking about. And so something I've been doing recently is using lots of little games and challenges in classes rather than giving people like really explicit instructions about how to do movements. And that's been a really interesting experience and I think there are movements that I think it works fantastically well for as well as some where it's probably better to use a more traditional approach and give people like explicit detailed instructions which also kind of depends on the level they're at within the sport and how they learn and a whole bunch of other things and so I'm going to keep experimenting with that over the next year but I definitely recommend reading this book because it might make you rethink your approach to how you're learning basically any form of movement and by the way if you want to rethink your approach to learning like facts languages or other skills then I strongly suggest how we learn by Benedict Carey but I've already done a whole video on that so I'm just going to give the most important three lessons from it here which are that you should start projects as soon as you can to give them time to percolate in your mind varying your learning environment and style can actually give you more context cues to help you remember stuff and testing yourself at spaced intervals is really crucial to learning honestly though do watch the video I think it's pretty good let's go straight on to we are Bellingcat. So if you've never heard of Bellingcat, they're a collective of online investigators that use publicly available information to conduct investigations into stuff like war crimes, troop movements, like things that are going on around the world. By the way, the name comes from a story about a group of mice that are discussing different ways to make a cat harmless. Someone comes up with the idea of belling the cat so it won't be able to move without making a noise, but none of the mice want to do it. So the idea is that like belling cat are the group that have taken this task on to make the world a little bit safer for everyone. And so this book is a sort of combined history of the organization, an explainer of how they did some of their biggest investigations. And I found it really fascinating, not just because of what they've achieved, but because of how the founder did it. Elliot Higgins, who founded belling cat, was actually unemployed when he started the organization. And he like put it together in his bedroom, teaching himself to do things like identify the weapons being used in different conflict zones from videos that were being shared on social media. Fast forward to the present day and he's running this organization with more than a dozen employees that's like in contact with human rights groups and has done a whole ton of good all around the world. And so I think this book does a great job of showing you what you can achieve if you look at like the skills and interests you already have and how to combine them together in a way that like solves problems that the world has. And so I think that's a great reason to read it. And if you want a little nudge in that direction, then I super recommend the next book, which is Friendly Ambitious Nerd. Okay, so this is an ebook by Visakan Virasami, who I just started following on Twitter this year. And you could probably read the whole thing in about two hours, but it's really worth reading. It's basically about the power of being friendly or cultivating your social skills by doing things like learning to ask good questions or giving specific and sincere compliments. Ambitious, which in the context of the book means wanting to like learn more, see more, do more. And nerdy, which Visakan calls developing the courage to be honest with yourself about what you find interesting without worrying too much about what other people think. And so it's one of those books where I found myself taking notes all the time, noticing little things here and there that I'm either gonna put into action in the future or wish that I'd known in my early 20s. So I definitely recommend it if you're kind of still young and working out how, how relationships in the world work. But even if you're older with kids and in a grounded relationship like I am, you'll probably still get a bunch out of it. And if you have young kids, you will probably also benefit from Lifetime. So I actually spoke to Russell Foster, who's a professor of neuroscience at the University of Oxford, uh, for a feature I wrote earlier in this year. And he was just a lovely, fascinating man. He was just like one of those guys who want to explain everything they know about their subject in really digestible language so that anyone can understand it. And so probably not surprisingly, this is an absolutely fascinating read written by a guy who's totally on top of his subject matter and wants to explain it as well as he can. It's basically a look at the current science of the body clock and how things like the time we eat, the time we get up, the time we first look at the sun in the morning can drastically affect the way we feel in our health outcomes. It's kind of pretty practical. It's introduced me to the science on a bunch of like when you should do things throughout the day. You might have heard Andrew Huberman's advice about trying to see the sun early in the morning. Turns out there's some very good science backing that up. You might have also heard that blue light for you at night is bad and that's kind of not so true. There's a bunch of stuff about that in the book as well. Super recommended read, pretty easy to read, get on it. So those are the 12 books I read this year that I would recommend to basically absolutely anyone. But if you wanna learn more about the five best books I've ever read and the ones that I think changed my life, there's a link to that right here. Thanks very much for watching.